Thank you all, and <clears throat> now it is my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker for tonight. Uh, Michael Schellenberger is a leading energy security and environmental expert. He advises policymakers around the world, including the U.S., Japan, Taiwan, South Korea, the Philippines, Australia, United Kingdom, the ne Netherlands, and Belgium. He is co-founder of Breakthrough Institute, where he was president from 2003 to 2015, and served as an advisor to MIT's Future of Nuclear Energy Task Force. Michael has personally helped save nuclear reactors around the world, from Illinois and New York to South Korea and Taiwan. He is a regular contributor to Forbes, the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and the Washington Post, and his TED Talks have been viewed over four million times. Michael was featured in Pandora's Promise, an award-winning film about environmentalists who changed their minds about nuclear. He debated Ralph Nader on CNN's Crossfire and Stanford University's Mark Jacobson at UCLA. He's been an environmental and social justice advocate for over 25 years. He is the founder and president of Environmental Progress. As one of the world's leading pro-nuclear environmentalists, Michael is considered a climate guru and high priest of the atomic humanist movement. Michael, thank you for coming tonight, and we look forward to enjoying your presentation. Thank you very much. It's a real uh, privilege and honor to be giving the uh, Edward Teller Lecture. I want to talk tonight about the challenges facing nuclear, and I want to take you back in time a bit to understand the roots of the crisis that we currently face. So the first thing to keep in mind is that there is a very strong economic uh, consensus among economics that we need significant quantities of energy in order to live prosperous lives. There, the Germans might use a bit less energy than Americans, but that's mostly a function of the fact that there's higher population densities allowing for more mass transit and less driving. But it, what it means is that all nine going on 11 billion people in the world are gonna need to consume very large quantities of energy over the next century. And what this means is that there will be significant amounts of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere contributing to climate change. Uh, while I don't think this is, should be treated as an apocalyptic threat in the way that many of my colleagues do, it is a long-term risk and it's something that the majority of Americans want to do something about. When you look at those countries that have significantly reduced the carbon dependence of their energy systems, all of them have done so principally with nuclear energy. Sweden, France, Switzerland, Belgium, France being the most famous with 75% of its electricity from nuclear, but there is no country that has significantly decarbonized its electricity supply as a major economy with renewables. So while everybody talks about Germany as a climate change leader, France actually gets more than twice as much of its electricity from clean energy sources as Germany. You can see here, a gener a German, German electricity produces 10 times the carbon emissions per unit of electricity as French electricity. So one question is just, is the, are the problems facing nuclear, its cost, is it too expensive? Well, all of you have been in the midst of a big debate over the cost overruns at the Vogel plant, Vogel units three and four. There's a similar debate occurring in Britain over the construction of Hinkley Point C. It's worth putting these cost overruns into perspective. You can see that in comparison, the cost overruns at Hinkley are similar to the cost overruns in Brazil's constructing of stadiums in the World Cup. And they don't come anywhere in comparison to the $62 billion of cost overruns for the International Space Station. So all big construction projects experience cost overruns. And while that may be cold comfort, I think it helps to put into context the unique challenges that nuclear faces. So you can see here we have four major sources of low emissions electricity around the world, hydro in blue, nuclear in green, wind and solar in orange and yellow. And what my colleagues Mark and Madison have discovered when they total up the amounts is that we spent 
a little bit less than, about the same amount of money to get twice as much electricity from nuclear as we get from solar and wind. So if we think nuclear is expensive, it's still about half as much as renewables. You can see that at the time when everybody's been talking about the cost of renewables coming down, the significant deployment of renewables in Germany contributed to making electricity 50% more expensive. A similar dynamic has occurred in California where we saw our electricity prices rise seven times more than in the rest of the United States as a consequence of deploying significant amounts of solar and wind. And you can see here the French spend a little bit more than half as much for electricity that is 10 times less carbon intensive than the German electricity. And this was all predicted by a German economist. In 2013, he just found that as wind and solar produce more and more electricity, their economic value goes down because they're producing too much electricity when you don't need it and not enough electricity when you do need it. And what we find is that had Germany spent the $580 billion, it will have spent on renewables by 2025. On nuclear, it would already have 100% of its electricity from clean energy sources and have had enough electricity to, pr to provide all of the power for its transportation fleet were it to be electric cars. So there's been some, we have succeeded in saving nuclear plants in various states and with some modest subsidies that have been criticized by people that say they care about climate change. But in every case, we find that the size of those subsidies is just a fraction of the subsidies that are extended to solar and wind. So that was New York. You can see uh, New Jersey, New York, Illinois. And at the federal level, wind and solar received about 94 times more in subsidies than nuclear. So one of the questions that the people have is, is it just really dangerous? The evidence on this question has been clear for the last half century. The latest study by, in the British medical journal Lancet finds that nuclear is already the safest way to make electricity. And you can see here, um, it produces so few, so few people are harmed by it that it doesn't even register on the graph. And the reason is because seven million people's lives are shortened every year from just breathing ordinary air pollution. So even if you're a little bit skeptical of climate change or you don't really think it's gonna be a big problem, air pollution still has significant health consequences. And that's led my friend, the climate scientist James Hansen, to conclude that nuclear power has actually already saved two million lives that would have been lost to breathing air pollution from fossil fuels and biomass. And so people say, well, isn't wind and solar much safer? In fact, and I'm just curious, how many people have ever seen this photo? A couple of you. Uh, we, we have a new study coming out that my colleagues have just completed finding that wind has, uh, has caused 10 times more deaths from wind power accidents than nuclear power accidents. This is two maintenance workers on top of a wind turbine in the Netherlands in 2013. A fire broke out. It's actually taken from a video. They embrace right before one of them attempts his luck and jumps off the turbine and dies, and the other one is engulfed in flames. So people sometimes say to me, well, maybe people are afraid of nuclear because the accidents are so spectacular. I always point out, this is a pretty spectacular accident that almost nobody has heard about. And if you ever see the, the photos or the video of Fukushima, there's nothing spectacular about it at all. It's hard to see anything going on that seems um, particularly dangerous. What about nuclear waste? Even within the nuclear community, there's a view that we have a significant waste problem and that somehow that's contributing to the problems that nuclear energy is having. Well, the truth is there's hardly any of it. It's stored in steel and concrete canisters. All of it can fit onto a single football field stacked 50 feet high. As an environmentalist, it's precisely what I was taught to want and do want from any productive process, which is that the waste byproducts from production are internalized at the site of production rather than externalized into the natural environment where they cause harm. So currently, I'm satisfied with the waste solution we have, which is that we store our used fuel rods on site. There's very few of them. They've never hurt anybody. They're never going to hurt anybody unless we do something with them that could cause some harm. I got tired of answering the question of what do we do with all the nuclear waste, and so I asked uh, Mark, I said, could you please calculate what we're gonna, how much solar panel waste 
And whenever I raise this, some people kind of go, what do you mean solar panel waste? There's no waste from solar panels. And we point out, in fact, the solar panels themselves become waste after 20, 25 years. The plan right now, well, there is no plan right now what to do with the solar panel waste. They, I think a lot of environmentalists think you can, they'll compost them and biodegrade. In truth, what we're going to do with them is that, in, in the sense of uh, benevolence, what Americans and Europeans will do is we'll send them to poor countries in Africa. They'll get a couple more years of life from them. And then they will smash them into pieces to extract any valuable raw materials, exposing themselves to harmful levels of dust from lead and other toxic heavy metals, which incidentally, their toxicity never declines because they're fundamental elements. So let's take a look at where we think we're headed now. It's nice to be somewhere where people appreciate nuclear and know of its importance, but the big picture isn't so positive. The United States has already prematurely closed six gigawatts of nuclear capacity in the last six years, and we're gonna close another eight gigawatts over the next seven. So there's 99 gigawatts of nuclear energy in the United States. So we're talking about losing a significant amount of nuclear power in a very short period of time. In fact, we calculate that we could end up using 30 times as much nuclear capacity as we gain by 2030. So I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that this is an industry that is in a state of crisis in the sense of not having a clear future of growth, um, much less, uh, or of stasis, much less of growth. And so when you calculate what's gonna happen on, if current trends continue, if nothing is done to save nuclear, our capacity will fall below China's in 2030 and below Russia's shortly after. And this is what new nuclear around the world looks like. It's a world you can see in blue are the, all the reactors that China is already planning on building. This is already, these are already very high likelihood to be built. This is not speculative. And in the red is Russian with just a small amount coming from our allies in green France and in Korea. Japan, India, um, in the other colors. So this is a world where nuclear is about to be dominated by at least one country that most national security analysts view as our, our chief geopolitical rival. So what's going on? I think in order to understand this problem, we have to go back in time to the birth of nuclear energy in the mid part of the last century. Um, we can see that at bottom here, there's just a deep unpopularity with nuclear. A global survey finds that nuclear has a positive connotation from just about a third of the public. It's just a little bit more popular than coal. And the reason is because people think it's dangerous. It doesn't take, this is from focus groups, just the words that people use around nuclear is that they're afraid of it. So how do we get here? Well, if you go back to the early part of the 20th century before nuclear energy was even invented, there was positive, it was mostly positive views of what it was gonna be. This is from a best-selling book at the time by Frederick Soddy. A race which could transmute matter would have little need to earn its bread by the sweat of its brow. Such a race could transform a desert continent, thaw the frozen poles, and make the whole world one smiling garden of Eden. Very different view of climate change, by the way, than I think we have right now. But the sense was, this was a highly energy dense fuel, a small amount of natural resource could yield uh, significant amounts of energy to power human civilization. And this positive view of nuclear was strongest among environmentalists who were called themselves conservationists in the mid 20th century. So the president of the Sierra Club in the 1960s was one of the strongest advocates for nuclear. Will Siri, he said, cheap energy in unlimited quantities is one of the chief factors allowing a large, rapidly growing population to set aside wild lands, open space, and lands of high scenic value. Even our capacity and leisure to enjoy this luxury is linked to the existence of cheap energy. So cheap, abundant energy was viewed as good for the natural world. It was something that would allow us to protect more of the natural world. This view would be challenged within just a few years. In 1946, the father of the atomic bomb, Robert Oppenheimer, authored a proposal that went to the United Nations called the Baruch Plan, where he proposed that the United Nations control all of nuclear energy, 
not just nuclear weapons, but also nuclear power plants, uranium mining. Um, and he also had an idea which persists today that there would be some technical fix to prevent uranium from being used as bombs. This was known as the Baruch plan, and it failed very quickly in the United Nations within a matter of months. And this upset Oppenheimer, who felt guilty about having created the bomb. And so he insisted that it had to be put under international control. The safety of the nation cannot lie wholly or principally in scientific or technical prowess, he wrote, can only be based on making future wars impossible. By the 1950s, Admiral Hyman Rickover of the Navy was given the task of creating nuclear submarines and aircraft carriers. And he was sort of the new star of nuclear. He was the new darling of nuclear. And Oppenheimer was already fading. His great work was done, and he was slipping into alcoholism and depression. And, but he was still very powerful. He was part of the Atomic Energy Commission, or rather an advisor uh, to the Atomic Energy Commission. And when uh, Rickover presented his plans to Oppenheimer, Oppenheimer was very critical of them, saying nuclear power is a dangerous engineering undertaking, just, just four years after the bomb had been created. And in fact, after when Rickover presented uh, Oppenheimer with a little wooden submarine model for the Nautilus, the first nuclear submarine, left it as a little gift, which he was famous for doing. After Rickover left the room, Oppenheimer got up and in front of his colleagues picked up the little wooden replica and smashed it in his hands. So what's important here is that the war on nuclear as a whole technology, not just the bomb, came from within, not just within the nuclear community, but from, from the very person who had done the most to create it. But the fears of nuclear were, mo were strongest among the left, among liberals, socialists, progressives, Democrats. George Orwell said, he said he worried that the bomb would create world peace, but that it would be what he called a cold war. He invented this idea that he called it, it would be a peace without peace, meaning that we would be stuck with significant amounts of anxiety over the destructive power of this bomb. And by 1953, after the election of President Eisenhower, Oppenheimer wrote a very famous essay for Foreign Affairs magazine based on a speech he gave to the Council on Foreign Relations where he said that the United States and the Soviet Union were like two scorpion it's under glass, each capable of killing the other, but only at a cost to his own life. And Eisenhower respected Oppenheimer very much, and he wanted to look for a positive potential in nuclear. And so he, in fact, he complained to his advisors, you know, is this the best we can do, is just to be afraid of this technology, or can we find something that would redeem humankind and our creative potential? And that's when he spoke at the United Nations. I always think it looks a lot like a church, almost, a church of humankind, a secular church, but a church nonetheless, everyone in their pews. And he gave his really famous Adams for Peace speech. The most famous line is where he says, we would mobilize experts to provide abundant electrical energy to the power-starved areas of the world. Hugely popular speech. Afterwards, there was a brief pause and then the delegates all rose and gave him a standing ovation that lasted 10 minutes. And it was incredible publicity. It was almost a sense, I think, of the people of the world of a kind of relief that there would be some redemption from this technology, that it wouldn't just be for destruction. But pretty quickly, other atomic scientists started to raise fears of nuclear energy. So Mike Wallace, who later became the host of 60 Minutes, interviewed George Lapp, who was one of the creators of the bomb at the Manhattan Project. And Wallace said, suppose science could invent an instrument, a source of fantastic energy that would be great good to mankind, but also might enable a scientist to literally destroy the entire world with a push of a button. As a scientist, would you help invent that force? Such a funny question, because of course we had already. <laughs> But he asked it as a hypothetical and lab said, I would not. I think this is a case where we're finding that scientists are becoming more and more socially conscious. So you found the scientific community starting to oppose nuclear energy. And meanwhile, when you read the histories of this period, there's a sense in which 
the greatest generation that had fought World War II were started to traumatize their children, the baby boomers, by doing these duck and cover exercises in schools. And Susan Sontag, the great literary critic, described how there was all these Hollywood movies about these um, about radiation striking some animal or something and then it becoming a huge ant or this gigantic person. And that's not what radiation does, but nonetheless, and then the military and the scientists would get together and they would kill the radi radioactive villain. And so Sontag argued that this was sort of a psychologically a way to resolve the anxiety created by nuclear. So there's incredible psychological tension during this period that I think we haven't overcome yet. McCall's by 1957, the most read women's magazine, had a cover story about radioactivity poisoning your children, referring to the fallout from nuclear weapons testing being now detected in, in babies' teeth. Um, it helpfully had another article there you can see, which was um, how to relax in 10 minutes. So after you got done reading about how your baby's being poisoned. And so, what we find is that there continues to be a major gender gap with nuclear energy being much more strongly supported by men than women. Most people will believe this has something to do with maternal fears of radiation. And I, there's also, a, I think, a growing consensus that what, 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 what happened is that the fears of nuclear weapons were displaced. That's just a fancy word for that we, we, our fears went from the bomb and they were displaced onto power plants. So we sort of scapegoated the power plants. And there was a sense in which, in fact, I interviewed somebody recently who said he remembered when they went from being anti-weapons campaigners in the 70s to being opposed to nuclear power plants. And I said to him, I said, well, what was the idea? I mean, so you thought if you got rid of the power plants, you'd get rid of the weapons? And he kind of, he's like, yeah, we never, we didn't really think about it like that. It was a kind of irrational, emotional reaction against power plants. The nuclear energy community didn't help itself very much by depicting its power plants like bombs, um, devoid of humans. In fact, there's actually a couple of humans here, but it's the dark and shadowy figure in the lower right-hand corner. And so the sense in which is that uh, nuclear power plants are either bombs or they're places for making bombs. And that, that was my perception as an anti-nuclear teenager, and it's also very, very prevalent um, among about a third of the population doesn't take much to see that as a bomb. In fact, um, when Niels Bohr, the great physicist, came back from Europe and said that the Nazis were making a bomb, and he drew a picture of what he thought was the bomb, he showed it to Enrico Fermi. It was, in fact, it was a picture of a reactor. And Fermi was like, oh my god, the Nazis are going to throw a reactor at London? Um, the confusion between reactors and bombs has been around since there was a bomb. Anti-nuclear campaigners very quickly picked up on these fears and used them to their benefit. Our campaign stressing the hazards of nuclear power will supply a rationale for increase in regulation and add to the cost of the industry. So already we are uh, eight years after the humanistic pro-nuclear president of the Sierra Club is dethroned and replaced by this anti-nuclear and very misanthropic president and they start to campaign against nuclear. A nuclear accident could wipe out Cleveland and the survivors would envy the dead, said my debate opponent, Ralph Nader, in 1974. They were very explicit in trying to make that connection in people's minds. A million people die in the Northern Hemisphere now because of plutonium from atomic weapons testing, said the other head of the Sierra Club. And so you can see in popular culture, in the movies and books and television, this kind of weird orange glow that is, the idea is that that's what a nuclear bomb would look like, and it shows up, the bomb shows up as reactors in every, and it shows up in the most recent Korean version. And when I was a child, when I was 12 years old, this film, ABC encouraged parents to watch this with their kids. Um, so I have had nightmares about mushroom clouds my entire life. It showed children being carbonized in the classrooms, a mother holding her baby being carbonized and a little boy being incinerated. So you can see a uh, little wonder why these fears have persisted. I summoned the courage recently to watch the HBO television series Chernobyl, 
my colleagues are both millennials and they were like, you know, they were like, our generation, before the show came out, they were like, our generation doesn't have all the hangups that you Gen Xers and baby boomers have. And then after Chernobyl came out, they were like, okay, it's now we do, you know, it's here now. Um, was my, one of my most read columns, but debunked it. And at the, if you see the show, that's what they say. At the, at the end of the show, he says, the Chernobyl reactor becomes a bomb, which is just absurd. But that's at bottom, that's what's at bottom of all the fears. And so I think it's important to understand what's going on here, that nuclear was viewed as clean and safe in the 50s, an alternative to coal, which was dirty and making our cities full of smoke. Then it was viewed as dangerous, and then it was viewed as immoral, and then it was viewed as dirty. So when we, people, nuclear waste, for us, we think it's cl the cleanest kind of waste, right? Perfectly contained, never hurts anybody, never contaminates the environment, it's perfectly clean. But when you talk to envir a lot of envir anti-nuclear environmentalists, they think it's super dirty. It's a contamination. But that came after they thought it was immoral. So I think this is a caution that if you think you're going to overcome people's fears by doing something different with the waste, you're misunderstanding what occurred in how nuclear waste became perceived as dirty. The other thing that was going on is that people, environmentalists, were just worried there was too many people in the world. Some of this also, I think, was an apocalyptic fear. You might know that uh, all the, the front runners in the Democratic primary race, you have two things going on. Democratic primary voters say climate change is the most important problem in the world right now in the polling, and the Democratic front runners are against nuclear energy to solve the climate crisis. So is the climate crisis is the end of the world, but we can't use nuclear because that's the end of the world. What explains it is this history. This is how you can understand where this is coming from. Too many people, apocalyptic threat, the idea was cheap and abundant energy was gonna fuel the human cancer, destroy our scenic California. Just too much cheap, clean energy was a bad thing. So when we talk about nuclear being cheap, clean, and abundant as its benefit, it's not the way people see it. Giving society cheap, abundant energy be the equivalent of giving an idiot child a machine gun, said the most famous of the misanthropic anti-nuclear activists. So in 1966, the good guys worked, they were United Nations blue helmets, basically, right? I mean, if you see Star Trek, you're like, these guys are peacekeeping forces in the universe. Kind of like anthropologists, though, too. They don't want to interfere with the local cultures. They're in a nuclear-powered ship. They're sort of pro-nuclear sci-fi heroes, but you get to Star Wars in 1977, and the bad guys are in the nuclear-powered ship. And he's more machine than man, and they, they blow up Tatooie, right? Princess Leia's planet with nuclear, with a nuclear death ray. I mean, they give it a different name, but it's all nuclear. So just within those, that decade, the whole culture has flipped on the issue of nuclear until we're left with these horrible Ewoks in their renewable powered society in the most miserable moment in the Star Wars, otherwise great trilogy. And so we're, where's this love of, renew so the love of renewables become stronger even than the fear of nuclear. In fact, that was my history. I was afraid of nuclear. The Cold War ended, not as much to be afraid of anymore. And then it manifested as a fear of climate change as apocalypse with renewables. And so this is what Google Images looks like when you Google renewables. If you Google nuclear, it looks very different. And so the idea was that solar technologies are already here. There's no need for nuclear or solar or nuclear or fossil fuels in the 1970s. We already have all the solar energy technologies we need, renewables. So the love of renewables also became about harmonizing with the natural world, healing our relationship with nature, and undoing the break with nature that occurred when we learned how to split the atom. And as a consequence, my colleague Madison has, we've gone through every single nuclear plant proposed and planned in the United States and identified that over 140%, we had 140% more nuclear capacity planned that was ended up killed than ever built. So for the nuclear community says, look, we're gonna resolve all of your concerns by just doing it different next time. Okay, we're gonna just build a different kind of nuclear plant. So we see we're gonna use fluoride and 
and beryllium as the, as the coolant, as a molten salt reactor, we'll use thorium or we'll use sodium as a metal with a coolant, that will resolve everybody's concerns and nobody has any rem memory of history. And so Mark and Maddie created these slides just to show how many experiments we did. The experimental breeder reactor, 1951 to 1964, so the predecessor to the sodium fast reactor. That then led to the one at uh, the Santa Susana Field Laboratory, 1951 to 1964. The molten salt reactor, 1954 to 1955. The first LWRs, the Los Alamos, the um, uh, Los Alamos reactor, 56 to 59. The predecessor to the MSR, the homogeneous reactor experiment. Another version of that in the sodium reactor. I mean, it kind of goes on. So we've been testing these, testing these. Everybody comes along and says, I've invented a new way, but in fact, it was all already done over the last 50 years. We had a beautiful high temperature gas reactor near my hometown in Greeley, Colorado. Beautiful plant, complex, difficult to manage, too expensive, they shut it down early. So the story that advocates of alternative nuclear give is that we just, we got stuck with the wrong technology, right? We, it was because of Rickover, it was his fault. We got stuck with this bad light water reactor. The truth is, our reading of this history is that Rickover is the true hero here. A man who is as great of an inventor as Edison, nobody's heard of him, greater than Steve Jobs. And in fact, the design that everybody wanted and we started with was the gas-cooled reactor. That was the one that the engineers loved. That was the one that the British loved. That was the one that the French loved. Light water reactors came in later. And the synergy with military, which is put down by some pro-nuclear people, was actually the success of nuclear. You had all the Navy nukes that came out of the Navy and worked on light water reactors. And yes, we didn't, we didn't know how to run them very well at first. We only, they only ran for about half of the time, but now they run 90% of the time. So we just got better and better at running our nuclear plants. And you can see the, the best available data sources show very clearly that, that water-cooled nuclear plants are the cheapest ones we have. Um, and it's because we have so much experience using them. Contrary to other energy technologies, design innovation leads to construction cost increases. This desire from within the nuclear engineering community to creating different designs, maybe this time the public will accept us for our design, it makes the nuclear plants more expensive. Why did we need an AP1000? I love the AP1000, we'll do everything we can to see that succeed, but what was wrong with the combustion engineering design at Palo Verde? Well, because somebody said there would, might be some problem, we needed some water above or something, we're always trying to, and now we think that's, we don't want to do the AP1000 anymore. Now we're going to move on to something different. The, Bill Gates has got a new reactor. That'll fix all of our problems. In fact, what governments keep doing is choosing to work with construction firms that have experience building the designs that we have the most experience building. That's what brings the cost down. Well, maybe the activists, the anti-nuclear activists will be won over. In fact, the anti-nuclear activists fear monger against the alternative designs just as much as they do the current designs. Imagine the consequences from a fertilizer truck bomb detonated to a containment light molten salt reactor, truly a nuclear nightmare. And then what about the waste? They, my friend Richard Rhodes confronted Ralph Nader in an interview in the, in the 90s. He's like, you don't really want to solve the waste problem, do you, Ralph? Nope, that'll just prolong the industry. So there's a game being played by anti-nuclear activists that we, the industry and the, the nuclear community has taken literally, we should have been taking it figuratively. So what do we do? I'm already over my time. I, we, this is a spiritual and cultural and psychological problem. This is not a technical problem. We're still dealing with the initial trauma of dealing with this incredible revolutionary technology, as significant as the invention of fire. We've only had one way to make heat up until nuclear fission. Um, now we have two, and it was just born with this traumatic event. I think the most important thing to do is for us to just tell the truth about what's happened. There's been a sense in which there's secrecy. This is all some secret agenda. And I think that all stems from the fear of the bomb. So we need to tell people you need a lot of energy to power the world if everybody's gonna live high energy lives like us. Mostly it's positive. 
I'm not a dogmatist actually about nuclear. If you're burning coal, if you're burning wood for fuel, then you have a right to burn coal because that's better than wood. And if you're burning coal, then moving to natural gas is better, cleaner than coal. And if you're using natural gas, you should be using uranium. So it's going backwards to go from uranium to natural gas, but it's going forward to go from coal to natural gas. What about the, the, the bomb? Well, we now have an incredible data set of all of the deaths from wars and battles since the 1400s. This has been uh, on a per capita basis. And what you see here is you see when gunpowder gets invented, the death tolls go way up, creates modern Europe. And then you get to 1945, I've circled it there, World War II, the Holocaust of the European Jews, which you might consider the apocalypse, sort of felt like it. And then something wild happens, which is that peace spreads with the bomb. Um, people kind of say, well, maybe it's a coincidence, except for every time you look at where people would have, you would have expected to see wars, you didn't see them because both sides had the bomb. Um, after the Cold War, a bunch of people said, experts said, yes, but that's because we were civilized. Wait till it, the bomb goes to India and Pakistan. Those barbarians will use that against each other right away. In fact, we see that as soon as India and Pakistan get the bomb, they stop killing each other. They had a war actually earlier this year. You might have missed it because it lasted like five days. Uh, the Pakistani uh, insurgents killed 10 police officers on the Indian side. The Indians sent up a MiG fighter jet, pretended to shoot some camps. Both sides said that we're going to kill you. And then they were just like, you know what? That doesn't seem like a good idea. So the bomb has had the effect of creating world peace. Uh, who, who knew? We should be honest about that rather than pretending like nuclear energy has nothing to do with the bomb. We should explain to people that nuclear energy has a unique and transcendent moral purpose. It's the only way to lift everybody out of poverty while reducing humankind's environmental impact. We can lift everybody out of poverty with fossil fuels, but we're going to have a lot of deaths from air pollution. Even if you're skeptical of climate change, you're going to have a much larger impact on landscapes. If you have nuclear, will shrink our environmental footprint. I think we need to humanize the technology. This is how the nuclear industry portrays its technology. It's amazing. Apparently, it doesn't require any people to operate this control room. Amazing. This is what a control room actually looks like. It's run by beautiful people like my friend Heather Hoff, who started Mothers for Nuclear. I trust, I believe Diablo Canyon is a well-run plant because my friend Heather Hoff works there and her kids are nearby. I don't, I don't think it's because the machines are magical. Here she is with Kristen Zaitz, her co-founder. And we need to put these plants in their context, which is truly with humpback whales breaching in front of them. Not all nuclear plants have a humpback whale breaching, but my favorite one in California does. Uh, our current governor wants to shut it down in 2025 and replace it with natural gas and a veneer of renewables. That means that I think the nuclear community needs to take off our technological masks. We need to show our faces. We're, we're, we're humans. And, and that's what makes nuclear special, is that we're humans who care about this craft, this important craft that's so important to our security and our natural environment. And that means that we need to stand up for nuclear. Our, our industry is unfortunately not able to stand up for itself. They've, uh, the heads of the industry, Exelon, Southern, all good people, but they have said that they are just not able to do what nuclear needs to be able to compete with the Chinese and the Russians. I don't think we're going to build any more nuclear plants in the United States. I just don't think it's going to happen. I'm not arguing for the construction of new nuclear plants. They're too expensive. Nuclear at this point is a bridge to some other kind of carbon-free world. That's from a senior executive at Exelon. So when our own people are saying things like that, you know you've got a problem. The good news is that we have a president, whatever you think about him, wants to help. And so he had a meeting, he asked the industry, how can I help? And they didn't really have a very good answer for him. So we're circulating an open letter that has some very concrete things about how the United States can actually restore and retain our leadership against the Chinese and the Russians that you are all invited to sign. We're still waiting to hear from Exelon and Southern and Duke, who have not yet told us whether they'll sign the letter, even though we've 
been circulating it for three months now. Unless changes are made to restore public confidence, the nuclear age will come to a halt as the present reactors run the course. The warnings have been given now for 40 years from the, the, the leaders in the scientific and technical community. If we don't stand up for nuclear, nobody else will. My organization on a budget of about $700,000 a year with no industry uh, funding at all has been organizing protest marches, sit-ins with nuclear engineers, and we've been winning just by standing up for nuclear, simple stuff. The Koreans have done the same with success. The Taiwanese have been doing the same. We held our first nuclear pride fest in Germany last year. And this Sunday, and you can see it's had an effect on the culture. Sting, my youthful hero, has come out pro-nuclear. You can see it's having an effect on the culture, and this is what's happening. It's gone from clean and safe to dangerous and unnecessary to immoral to dirty to increasingly people say, okay, maybe it's necessary, maybe we need some of it, and eventually people will see it for what it is, which is a moral technology. And so this Sunday, an incredible, thanks to the organizing work of Madison and Alexandra and Paris in my office, there's gonna be 35 pro-nuclear, stand-up for nuclear events around the world this is how we save nuclear power. I hope you all join us. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Enlightening and, and unbelievably in, inspiring. So thank you again for, for your efforts. And, and I'd like to also commend Michael for, for being here tonight. Uh, for those that aren't aware, he arrived here this morning from Peru, and he's leaving tomorrow to go to Paris for this event coming up. So we're pretty fortunate that he found the time to come uh, to see us tonight. And so rather than leaving him with some kind of a trinket or a gift to, to carry around the world, uh, we're going to make a donation on his behalf to the Ruth Patrick Science Education Center here at USC Aiken. For those that aren't aware, Dr. Ruth Patrick was an American uh, botanist specializing in freshwater ecology in the 50s. She came at the request of the Atomic Energy Commission to baseline things here at the Savannah River site. And her work really basic, uh, led to the uh, practices of ecology that are used around the world today. Uh, she just uh, died in 2013 at the ripe old age of 105. So the uh, Ruth Patrick Science Education Center here at USC Aiken is named in her honor. Last year, the uh, center reached over 70,000 students, educators, and the public. So on Michael's behalf, we will be making a donation for them to continue their great efforts to support uh, science and technology and nuclear energy across uh, the region. So thank you again, Michael. So uh, to close out tonight, I'd really like to just thank everyone for being here on this, on this wonderful night. Again, thank you to Michael and his team for coming and, and enjoying uh, joining us tonight. I'd like to, again, thank our sponsors, our members, uh, the staff here at the USCA Convocation Center, the faculty, the, the catering, and, and everyone who was here involved. I'd like to thank John Collins and his staff at American Audiovisual Services for doing a great job and putting this program on tonight. And uh, most of all, I'd like to thank Allison Hamilton Molnar, who puts this on and does such a great job. So don't forget all our other calendar of events coming up, all these other activities that are going on this week during Nuclear Science Week. Uh, again, thank you for attending tonight, and I hope you all have a safe journey home tonight. Thank you. Thank you.